Sometimes I think we film historians are a bit like mad scientists, poking around in dusty vaults, stitching together our research, trying to give a jolt of new life to Hollywood's forgotten heritage. Fortunately, one film that's never been forgotten is James Whale's Frankenstein, one of the most influential and imitated motion pictures of all time. When the film was first released in 1931, Universal added a special prologue, part showmanship, but partly out of real apprehension that Frankenstein might be too much for nervous audiences of the Great Depression. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we've warned you. While Frankenstein may no longer really shock or horrify, it has never lost the power to fascinate. And Boris Karloff's star-making performance created one of the most instantly recognizable cultural images of the 20th century. So if my friend here doesn't make you nervous, perhaps you'll join us both as we enter the vaults of Universal Studios and open the Frankenstein Files. Have you never wanted to do anything that was dangerous? Karloff's performance is definitely unique and one of the great performances, in my estimation, in film. My father always referred to the monster as his very best friend. It's simply the most powerful character makeup ever created for the movies, ever. I wanted to be Dr. Frankenstein, you know, I wanted to be the guy who made the monsters, and, and those films were the ones that just inspired me. Most people have come to know the story of Frankenstein through the medium of motion pictures, especially the films produced by Universal and starring Boris Karloff. But the original tale was the work of a precocious teenaged writer, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Published anonymously in its first edition, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, was the result of a literary parlor game she played with Percy Shelley and Lord Byron during a rainy vacation in Switzerland in the summer of 1816. Come, Mary. Come and watch the storm. You know how lightning alarms me. They were all holed up in there. The weather was bad, and uh, uh, somebody came up with the idea, I think it might have been Percy or Lord Byron, that they should have a writing contest. Frightened of thunder, fearful of the dark, and yet you have written a tale that sent my blood into icy creeps. <laughs> Look at her, Shelley. Can you believe that bland and lovely brow conceived of Frankenstein? A monster created from cadavers out of rifled graves? We're so used to the Hollywood version of Frankenstein, the universal picture, with all of the electrical apparatus and the tremendous production value. Well, of course, Mary Shelley, when she wrote the book back in the early 19th century, described it somewhat differently. And if I may read just a paragraph, it leaves a great deal up to the imagination. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open it breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. And then she goes on. 
She left it deliberately vague, but you're not quite sure whether there was some black magic involved or whether there was some vague elixir or something, certainly not by, you know, thunder, lightning, electrical impulses, and so forth and so on. Uh, there was none of that. There's certainly many dimensions to this story. You know, we can talk about Faust. We can talk about the overachiever. We can talk about man trying to emulate God. There's so many aspects, which I think is the keynote as to why this particular idea has transcended time. The novel was perfect for stage dramatization. And uh, playwrights realized this right off the bat. It was just a few years after the novel was published that the plays started coming forth. In 1823, I believe, um, Richard Peake presented Presumption, which was the fate of Frankenstein, which actually was quite a, a melodramatic offering. It starred as the monster, an actor named um, Thomas Potter Cook, who became in the 1800s pretty much what Boris Karloff became in the 1900s. He, he became typecast playing the Frankenstein monster in all kinds of revivals of that play, in other plays. The stage production that most influenced Universal's film was the version written in 1927 by Peggy Webling and produced by the British actor manager Hamilton Dean. Dean himself played the monster. Film historian and former actor Ivan Butler was a member of Dean's company. And he had to rely wholly, of course, on stage makeup, which is quite effective. Uh, mixtures of greens and yellows and blues and uh, uh, a matted wig on the top. He had, he was uh, tall as I am, and he wore lifters up under, under his shoes, to make him a bit taller still, and he looked enormous. Hamilton Dean in the stage production actually was dressed very much like he was the, the monster, the creature, very much like Henry Frankenstein, the creator. They dressed very, very closely. And once again, it was the, the, the kind of the mirror image bit. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, it became fashionable to interpret the novel in a way that Victor Frankenstein and the monster were like yin and yang, opposite sides of the same coin, Jekyll and Hyde in one character, whatever. They were basically the same character. Dean played Frankenstein in repertory with his production of Dracula, which partly formed the basis of the Universal film starring Bela Lugosi. But unlike Dracula, the Frankenstein monster was a sympathetic character. There was this touch of pathos with regard to the monster. You know, he was to be pitied. He, uh, you know, he didn't ask to be brought forth into the world. And there he was. And he, because of his appearance, which was not his doing, that no matter where he went or what he did, people were frightened of him. He, used to, he throw, threw a dove out, uh, out of the window. We had a cage full of doves and one stuffed one. And Dean used to get very, very angry when he couldn't get hold of the stuffed dove because all the other doves were saying, what are you doing? So, and he used to fly, throw it out of the window and say, he, he never said fly, he said floy, floy, his most peculiar accent he had. Dean staged his melodrama with almost none of the special effects that would later become standard. His creation scene was a masterpiece of theatrical understatement. You just saw him move, and then he got up. <laughs> well, he got up very effectively. And the monster's ultimate revenge on his maker was staged with the simplest materials, enhanced immeasurably by dim lighting. He attacked Frankenstein, bent him over a table, and apparently tore his throat out. He had a, a bowl of red dye and a sponge, you see. He used to bend over and he'd pick out this dripping of throat red dye. It was really quite effective. There was a tremendous roll of thunder, flashes and lightning, and that, that was the final curtain. Techniques of the theater, especially expressionist theater, had a major influence on prototype horror movies produced in Europe during the 1920s. In terms of art direction, the German Expressionist cinema was characterized by intense light and dark, lots of shadows. Now, the Hollywood style uh, for a very long time was generally flat lighting, lighting to, to make sure people saw everything. When Hollywood filmmakers were first confronted with the German films, they were very surprised by the, the kind of atmosphere you could create, and, and that flows into to the horror films, especially that Universal made. Studio founder Carl Lemley was born in Germany and imported much European talent to Universal City. 
It was his son, Carl Jr., who was most attracted to horror themes, much to his father's initial disapproval. But the runaway success of Dracula was all that was needed for Junior Lemley to have his way with horror films. Frankenstein, another classic, was the obvious next choice. Frankenstein was originally a project to be directed by Robert Florey and to star Bela Lugosi. Bela Lugosi was a hot actor. He'd just come off of um, Dracula, so it was, again, a logical choice. And um, Florey claimed that some of the scenario, if not all of it, was basically his idea. Robert Florey was a, a Franco-American. He had grown up in, uh, partially in, in France and, and had started out in the 20s making interesting little experimental films that were very strongly influenced by German Expressionism. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari starred Werner Krauss and Conrad Veidt in a tale of mind control, madness, and murder. It was one of Flory's favorite expressionist films and a model for his proposed Frankenstein. There are similarities in that you have in um, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari the Werner Krauss character who in, in some ways creates this being, but he is without his own will. He is, he is a somnambulist to Caligari that keeps kind of bringing back almost from the dead. Another antecedent to uh, the Frankenstein, of course, is The Golem, which is also a film about a human-made monster that comes to life and then wreaks havoc. Although Bela Lugosi was announced as the star of Frankenstein, he had objections to the assignment almost from the beginning. With the success of Dracula, uh, he, he didn't want to play the monster, this mute, uh, heavily made up character. He thought he was too, uh, too uh, handsome and too well known. You know, There actually was a test scene of Lugosi shot for Frankenstein in the makeup. People who have seen it who were there all kind of describe Lugosi's makeup as basically resembling the golem. And the story is that Lugosi had a very clay-like uh, skin, clay-like look, and he also had this big head of hair. I keep hoping that this footage crops up somewhere. I would love to see it. The first writer assigned to the project was Dracula's Garrett Fort, who combined Flory's ideas with an unproduced stage adaptation of the Peggy Webling play by John Balderston. Despite Flory's passion for the project, another director was already waiting in the wings, and Flory was soon out of the picture. There was no paperwork in the files as to why he was taken off the project, but then, um, as we know, James Whale became the director. James Whale had come over from England. He had directed a very successful play in England called Journey's End with Colin Clive, who eventually played uh, Henry Frankenstein. Whale was a rapidly rising Hollywood director noted for his direction of World War I dramas. Sir Ian McKellen was nominated for an Academy Award for his portrayal of James Whale in the film Gods and Monsters, which earned writer-director Bill Condon an Oscar for adapted screenplay. Action. And it was exactly at the moment when so many theater directors were being imported by Hollywood to deal with the fact that actors suddenly had to speak. Whale was, I think, more than anything, responsible for the choice of Karloff. Well, my father um, had been in Hollywood about 10 years when he made Frankenstein in 1931. And what most people don't know is that it was his 80th, 81st film, I believe. He was in um, many, many silent films and, and also in a lot of uh, talkies before Frankenstein. He was having lunch in the commissary, dressed in one of his good suits and looking very spiffy. And uh, James Whale spotted him. Whale saw his face and was fascinated by the bone structure of it and called him over to have some coffee or something like that. Uh, Whale, as he put it, uh, engaged in general conversation about England and about the problems of English actors and English directors in Hollywood, and then suggested that he had a role for which he would like Boris Karloff to do a screen test and would Karloff be willing to do it and Karloff jumped at it without even knowing what it was. My father used to say his feelings were a bit hurt since he didn't, he was looking his very best that day, and to be uh, considered for the role of the monster, he thought, hmm, but he was wise enough to take the part, and uh, with the help of Jack Pierce and his genius makeup, they, they went on to make uh, cinema history. Jack Pierce was the, the creator of all the classic Universal horror makeups, and, and he was the head of the makeup department at, at Universal during the Golden Age. You know, and he was the man that did you know did the Frankenstein's monster and the Mummy and the Wolfman and, and, and 
all the classic makeups. And, and he didn't have the luxury that we have today of the modern materials. Everything that he did was kind of an out of, out of the kit kind of makeup. You know, everything was fabricated. And, and he was a master at it. And he did, you know, I mean, this, this makeup, the Frankenstein's monster, everyone knows this. You know, I mean, they, it's a instantly recognizable. And, and uh, it's, it's one of the all-time great makeups. And I, I just hope someday I can do something that, that, that comes close to that. Of course, there's a great deal of debate about that makeup, you know. A lot of people think that it was inspired by James Whale rather than by Jack Pierce. Of course, Jack Pierce naturally would say that he was the man, although he did say at one time that it was a compromise. Who came up with the monster's makeup and look? Oh, my idea, muchly. Well, my sketches, big, heavy brown. The head flat on top so you could take out the old brain and put in the new, like, tinned beef. <laughs> The monster's trademark square forehead may have been partly inspired by Thomas Edison's 1910 version of Frankenstein, in which Charles Ogle played the monster. But there's no question about who executed that job. It was Pierce. The films really are a collaborative effort, you know, and, and so many so many people are in the mix, and, and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I think this was a case where it all worked so well when you had James Whale, Boris Karloff, Jack Pierce, just all the people involved in this film, it all just clicked. I, I've seen photos of an earlier test. It was very similar. He still had the flat head and the, and the brow like this, but there were these two kind of ridges on, the, on his uh, forehead with a little kind of semicircular clamp on each one. In fact, it's a, a photo that cr still crops up when they need a picture of the monster. They, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess the photo editors weren't too careful about which, <laughs> whether it was really in the film or not. The frontal bone, the brow here, was fabricated out of cotton and spirit gum and, and collodion, which is this really strong smelling, a very solventy smelling uh, plastic. And, and you would put on a coat of spirit gum and stick some cotton on it and paint some collodion on it and gradually build up the form. Same with the whole top of his head here, the flatness of the head was built up that way. These techniques were quite painful, you know, to have this cotton and collodion built up every day, especially so close to your eyes with a strong solvent smell. Uh, and and the, the, the painful process of removing it as well. It had to be, he had to be, have amazing endurance to go through this. I'm sure it helped that it was early on in his career, you know. But, uh, from what my understanding is, the story goes that Karloff felt that in some of the original tests, he was just too, he looked too alive, his eyes looked too alive. So he, he suggested that Jack do something to it. And so they ended up building up these heavy eyelids with mortician's wax over Karloff's own lids, only allowing him to open them part way like this. But, uh, he was still able to give an, an amazing performance with these lids. Another thing that really helped helped that corpse-like appearance was uh, Karloff had a bridge on his on his right side, uh, which he removed so he could suck in his cheek, and that one side and, and, and Pierce shaded to it, shaded it to accentuate it. Again, when you think of this makeup, you think of the flat head and you think of the electrodes, which most people think are are bolts through his neck. Uh, but they were actually supposed to be how the electricity was I entered into his body. It was, there's like a positive and a negative, uh, like, like on a battery. Because it all worked with the contours of Karloff's face, he was able to express an, an entire range of emotions that other actors couldn't do under the makeup when they essayed the role. I think that's part of the beauty of this makeup, that it, he was able to perform in it because so much of it was his face. And, uh, and if he, would have, if he would have built up much more on him, he, he would have become very stiff. Collodion isn't really very flexible, especially when you mix it with cotton, it becomes quite, quite stiff. Well, not only was the makeup uh, arduous on and off every single day, it took three, three and a half hours to put on and almost as long to get it off. The wardrobe itself was heavy and black and they shot in the middle of August. The boots were heavy and cumbersome. I know there was one really torturous day, which I think was almost a 24-hour day. Um, in being made up like this, being outdoors, I, I think is when they shot the th th throwing the girl in the water scene, and then had to come back and shoot something else. And and uh, it, it had to be, you know, it was not a not a fun job, I'm sure, for Boris. You know, <laughs> but, uh, the most difficult part of the shoot was uh, my father carrying Colin Clive up the a hill time and time and time again until he got it right. Ultimately, he ended up having three back surgeries. He really suffered for the rest of his life physically um, because of just the physical uh, difficulties in, in shooting that film. Designer Herman Rossi originally conceived a futuristic look for Frankenstein, 
But in collaboration with art director Charles Hall and director Whale, the film took on a distinctly gothic look, with angles and shadows in keeping with Robert Flory's initial expressionist vision. The concept of the burning windmill also originated with Flory, who felt the laboratory should also be situated in the mill. Pre-production concepts for the monster itself by Hall and Rossi were obviously discarded by director Whale, an experienced production designer in his own right. He was very meticulous about every shadow and, and every camera setup and the, the way that the frame is filled so completely to the top. And, and there's an amazing verticality to the design of his sets. Emotionally, so much of Frankenstein leads, to, leads up to that moment when the monster sees the sun for the first time and reaches up trying to touch it. And it feels as though you wonder if the whole verticality of the movie isn't, wasn't designed by Will just to get you to that moment. The sizzling laboratory equipment was the handiwork of Kenneth Strickfadden, a Santa Monica inventor who put his mark on mad scientist laboratories for all time. The original machines would continue to put in movie appearances until the 1970s. Karloff was fourth billed in a cast headed by Colin Clive, an actor whose anguished roles sadly reflected his own inner turmoil. James Whale chose him over the previously considered Leslie Howard. Colin Clive, who played Henry Frankenstein, was a very Baroque personality, having rather a Jekyll Hyde personality, a Jekyll when he was sober. And really the whole company of Frankenstein was apprehensive at the time the film was made that Clive might begin drinking and become Mr. Hyde, if you will, one night in Hollywood, and it would greatly endanger the picture. But uh, Whale handled him with great sensitivity. American actress Mae Clark played Frankenstein's fiancée, Elizabeth, and shared her memories with film historian Gregory Mank. Mae Clark was still very much the actress. In fact, she insisted on acting out scenes from Frankenstein in her little cottage bungalow at the motion picture home. And uh, she got up and did the monster. She relished playing the monster. She went marching across the room with the monster steps. And she acted out his discovery of light and raised her hands to the skylight. And uh, she was really quite good. She made a good monster. Mae Clark adored James Whale. She said he was the pluperfect gentleman and the genius, is the way that she described him. He had directed her previously in Waterloo Bridge, in which he had a wonderful part as Myra the streetwalker who dies in World War I. And uh, so she already had a great relationship with Whale. Um, uh, she said that he was in, involved in every capacity of production. He'd be up on the boom crane tower. He'd be in the sound room. He had his, his finger on every single pulse of the picture. She talked about Colin Clive, uh, whom she had great sympathy and empathy for. She said that he was the uh, handsomest man she ever saw and also the saddest. And she had great sympathy for the torment that uh, drove him to an early death. She very much admired Boris Karloff. She said, uh, Dear Boris Karloff was a pussycat. In her great scene with Karloff, where they're in the boudoir and the monster comes through and stalks behind her and roars at her, and she screams, that um, she was terrified. She really was scared of him at that point, and she said to him, if I turn around and see you, I'm afraid how I'm going to react. And so Boris said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do, May. You just keep your eye on my upstage, away from camera, little finger, and I'll wiggle it. And you'll see the monster wiggling his finger, and know it's just Boris in makeup. And she said, so he did wiggle his little finger, which was a little finger compared to the rest of him. And um, that she got through the scene all right. Actor Edward Van Sloan, who had played the role of Professor Van Helsing in Dracula on stage and screen, brought a similar note of moral authority to the role of Dr. Waldman. Next to Boris Karloff, seven-year-old Marilyn Harris gave the film's most poignant performance. Would you like one of my flowers? Marilyn had an immediate rapport with Boris Karloff. She said that on the morning that the company assembled at Universal to go on location to Malibu Lake for the scene, there was this little parade of limousines, and that um, out came the monster. And she, at the age of seven, ran right up to him and took his hand and said, may I drive with you? And uh, Boris Karloff said, would you, darling? I mean, here was this child who was terrified of her mother, but who instinctively loved the monster. And she said it was like magic. And the magic really carries over to the scene. Karloff protested throwing Marilyn into the lake. He wanted James Whale to change the script. Karloff's idea was, why can't the monster just show his basic innocence by playing with the child and not having anything awful come of it? Uh, James Whale said, well, you see, it's all part of the ritual. This has to happen to show the tragedy of the monster. So Karloff, of course, accepted it. But when he did pick up Marilyn and throw her into the lake, 
she didn't sink. And so James Whale went up to her and he said, I'll give you anything you want if you'll do this scene over again. And Marilyn said, all right, I know what I want. He said, what? She said, a dozen hard boiled eggs because her mother always had her on a diet. So sure enough, Boris Karloff threw her again into the lake farther. And um, later she received her present from James Whale. It was two dozen hard boiled eggs. As Frankenstein's demented assistant, the former Broadway actor Dwight Fry followed an equally bizarre role for Universal as the insect-eating madman in Dracula. The character of Fritz, not in the novel, originated in the earliest stage productions of Frankenstein. I don't know how James Whale found my father, really. I mean, I don't know whether he saw Dracula and thought that, that was a good idea, to, for, he would be a good idea for Fritz, or whether he had seen some other of my dad's work, I don't know. But James Whale became, ultimately, during and after the making of Frankenstein, uh, a champion of my father's, and put him in, he was in five different James Whale films throughout his career. But the versatile actor was soon typecast in over-the-top horror roles. I think it is true that, that the larger-than-life figures that he may have played on, in, on film result from his character work and his acting work on Broadway, where you do have to project something more than just your own self. You have to be bigger than life on the stage. They're all weird and they're all crazy and they're to one extent or another, but they are different from each other. I think the first time I saw him, he was watching my reaction quite carefully. I was probably six at the time. And as I understand it from my mother, uh, when we came back and I went to bed and got up the next morning, my father was very upset that I hadn't been frightened by anything I'd seen. Children seem to empathize with the creature and and um, probably understood the message my father was trying to deliver with his portrayal, and that was that the monster or the creature, as he preferred to call him, was the victim and more than the perpetrator. And children seemed to understand that instinctively, he said, and they were not afraid of him, uh, and they were not afraid of the creature. The Frankenstein monster is totally innocent. Um, He's rather like an adolescent. He's in a world that is not of his making, and he doesn't completely understand the rules. And like many adolescents, he's a very clumsy, very awkward thing. So of course children across the world, you know, just graft it on to the Frankenstein monster, particularly the Boris Karloff Frankenstein monster, because they could see the inherent innocence. They could see the pathos. They could see that the Frankenstein monster was really very much a child like themselves. Film audiences often confuse Frankenstein's name with that of his creation, and possibly with good reason. James Whale seems to have been personally fascinated with the dramatic interdependency of the characters, according to film historian Paul Jensen. The film works, at least partially, because its maker empathized with those two, two characters. And I can't help but think that these are two people who are, each of which is a version of James Whale. For Whale, a self-made artist who overcame poverty and misunderstanding, the story of Frankenstein's creative struggle may have resonated deeply. Whale loved the, th the stage and the theater. You get an impression of this, but the dialogue nails it home. Um, when Henry says, uh, Quite a good scene, isn't it? One man crazy, three very sane spectators. The whole idea of it being a stage setting and he's the orchestrator of it, Whale brought out of or found in the situation something that I don't think other directors would have bothered or recognized. And that is something that taps into his own sense of, of demonstration, of presentation, of theatricality. One of the film's most effective and personal speeches was added during production and was possibly written by Whale himself. Where should we be if nobody tried to find out what lies beyond? You never wanted to look beyond the clouds and the stars, or to know what causes the trees to bud, and what changes the darkness into light. But if you talk like that, people call you crazy. Yeah, maybe Whale didn't write it, maybe Whale wrote it, I don't know. But it wasn't in the shooting script, but it's one of the most important scenes in the film. So. 
whale must have wanted it there. You know, and that's where this side of Henry is expressed. Sometimes I find that the scenes that don't contain the most dramatic action might reveal the director's style of work and his talent in, in ways that are unexpected uh, if we look at them carefully, those scenes. Um, one such scene in Frankenstein, for me, is the first conversation scene, the one between Victor and Elizabeth, where they're talking about Henry. It's a, a passive scene. So what does Whale do to try to make it seem alive or come alive? Um, take a look at that scene, because uh, aside from the fact that it begins with four close-ups, which itself is unusual, instead of an establishing long shot, we've got close-up of a framed photograph of Henry, close-up of the maid, close-up of Victor arriving, close-up of Elizabeth rising to greet him, and only then an establishing long shot. We've had to figure out what we're seeing and how those shots go together. We're involved because our mind has had to relate those shots together. We have a scene that could be thrown away by, some, by a lesser director that is actually turned into a highly visual and cinematic scene. The, the last third of Frankenstein is, is the part where at least the storyline has its weakest moments, I think. Um, there are certain things that happen in there that you have to simply take at face value and take for granted because they're not explained. Um, and, and I'm willing to allow that. I mean, there are little contrivances. Dr. Waldman's been murdered in the tower. Who, who finds Dr. Waldman's body? No one ever seems to go up to that uh, tower. Who found him? She has been murdered. Yeah! How does the, the girl's father know that she was murdered? Uh, all, we, all he would really realize is that she had drowned. Uh, we just have to accept that, right? Th those don't bother me particularly because I accept those, those statements to move the plot along. But the scene in which Henry locks Elizabeth in her room because he's afraid the monster might be around, and then he, the monster, enters Elizabeth's room and confronts her, is the one scene where I think a contrivance hurts the film considerably because it's a major scene. There is no way that we can have any idea how the monster knows whose house that is, if the monster knows whose house that is. But 1931 audiences paid scant attention to such implausibilities. For many, Frankenstein simply was an overwhelming experience. In 1931, so many of the things that Frankenstein showed and dealt with were, were rather unusual and new to people, and they tapped into things that were perhaps very dormant or, or things that people didn't want to consciously think about. We had thumping of the dirt on the top of the coffin. We had things that really were never shown before in the gibbet, you know, with this body hanging there and being cut down and the cadavers and reanimating. And I mean, it was just something that people, it's hard to believe now because the excess that we've all been subjected to over the decades. But in 1931, this was a big deal. What were they objected to in Frankenstein were obviously the little girl getting drowned. There were some uh, fairly graphic close-ups of the monster being stuck with hypodermic needles and um, where Fritz, the hunchback assistant, is tormenting the monster with a torch. There's some kind of horrific close-ups of the monster with the torch waving in front of his face. These are things that today would be, you know, you would see on G in G-rated movies on television. The scene with the monster throwing the little girl into the lake, that was cut in certain areas. Some people saw the entire scene. Some people saw him just reaching for her, which later when the father comes walking through the village holding her and she's in such disarray, actually created a much more sinister impact than what was intended. And there were pressure groups, the Legion of Decency, the Catholic pressure group. There were problems with the uh, Cullen Clive line, oh, in the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. In the original version that we got on television back in, since the 1950s, uh, whenever we would get to that scene, there would be a physical splice, and you could see a jump cut where Colin Clive is getting very ecstatic when the monster is coming to life and he realizes what he's accomplished. Well, during the early talkies, sound was not on a, what we have today, which is an optical track, which is a, which is a visual uh, strip along the edge of the film. Uh, 
in the old days, they were actually, the sound was recorded on records, big records about this size, and they were played in the theater, somehow synchronized with the projectors. In 1966, a friend of mine who was working at a local Los Angeles radio station called me, and he said, um, you'll never believe what's in our studio right now, these sound discs from uh, uh, Frankenstein, the original Frankenstein. And um, I was always disappointed when all the restored versions of Frankenstein always left this line out. With or without the censored footage, Frankenstein was a sensation, and the monster became a major new Hollywood icon. Boris Karloff's stardom was assured, although in real life he had little in common with monsters. He was the antithesis of the roles that he played. He really was a cultured, well-educated, articulate, well-read English gentleman who earned his living scaring children and little old ladies. Robert Florey's initial uncredited enthusiasm for Frankenstein was finally rewarded with an acknowledgement on the French poster and the chance to direct a highly stylized horror film in the expressionist manner. Murders in the Rue Morgue starred Bela Lugosi as a mad scientist destroyed by his own experiment and was partly filmed on the original Frankenstein sets. Universal spent four years developing a sequel to Frankenstein and it was well worth the wait. In what was finally called Bride of Frankenstein, Karloff returned and brought a whole new dimension to the monster, speech. I love dead, hate living. You're wise in your generation. A talkative monster and the creation of his mate were both elements from the original Mary Shelley novel. She's alive, alive! The Bride of Frankenstein. Karloff played the monster for a third and last time in Son of Frankenstein. This time he had a companion who did the talking for him, the broken-necked Igor, played by Bela Lugosi. He's my friend. He... He does things for me. Basil Rathbone played the title role of Wolf von Frankenstein. Is it the old legendary monster of my father's time? Or am I supposed to have whipped one up as a housewife whips up an omelet? Ghost of Frankenstein, the relationship between Igor and the monster got even closer. Your father was Frankenstein, that your mother was the lightning. Much closer. I, Igor, will live forever. Next, Universal paired two of its most popular monsters for amplified impact. I can't do it. I can't destroy Frankenstein's creation. I've got to see it at its full power. Since Bela Lugosi's brain had been sewn into the monster's head in the last film, it made some sense for Lugosi to finally play the monster himself, speaking in Igor's voice. But the effect was considered ridiculous by studio heads, and the monster was rendered voiceless again for the release print. Encouraged by the success of Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, Universal pulled out all the stops with House of Frankenstein, featuring its entire stable of monsters, with the curious exception of the mummy. Thank you. 
The creature was now played by former stuntman Glenn Strange in a halting robotic manner. Boris Karloff, wisely avoiding career quicksand, made his final appearance in a Universal Frankenstein film. In House of Dracula, Frankenstein's creation made the briefest of appearances, a thankless lurch around the lab. In Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, the classic Universal monsters were reunited for an affectionate spoof and for what many consider to be the best horror comedy ever made. Help me with this Excelsior. Come on, take it all out. Get it all out. Wow! Come on, Come on. Well, we got him. But the Frankenstein mystique didn't end with the films of the 30s and 40s. The universal tradition has inspired generations of filmmakers, even to the present day. The evil of Frankenstein, the evil of a man who created a monster by crude surgery and harnessed the tempestuous forces of nature to give it life. The laboratory equipment in Gods and Monsters was no longer the work of Kenneth Strickfadden, but the universal look was unmistakable. In 1997, Boris Karloff and Frankenstein had the unique honor of appearing on a U.S. Postal Service stamp, along with four other classic universal monsters. It was a wonderful experience. The post office could not have been better to work with and um, we got about 17,000 signatures all over the country. People pitched in and helped us. Uh, it, it was a very, very rewarding experience because people were so enthusiastic, and I think my father would be the one that would be most surprised and most pleased. He always stressed how grateful he was for having been given the opportunity by James Whale to play the monster, how it changed his whole life. He certainly had seen the opposite side of success for many, many years before fame came his way. And I don't think he ever uh, had uh, any difficulty with being typecast. He felt, and I heard him say on, on more than one occasion, that a typecast actor was a very lucky actor. Because if you had been able to uh, make a niche for yourself, do something that nobody else had done or was likely to do, uh, you were very lucky. You left your mark in your profession. He truly felt being typecast was the luckiest thing that ever happened to him. In her introduction to the revised edition of Frankenstein in 1831, Mary Shelley instructed her hideous progeny to go forth into the world and prosper. Exactly 100 years later, Universal took her directive to heart and created the most successful movie monster of them all. The original advertising campaign for Frankenstein featured the tagline, the monster is loose. And you know, it still is.